I can't wait for you to hear from today's guest, Morgan Adams. She is a transformative, holistic sleep coach. And I don't know about you, but sleep is one of the things that I have and still do sometimes struggle with. She helps women with sleepless nights get off the reliance of sleep medication. She has a very powerful toolkit that she talks about to help people not only have better quality of sleep, but also just change their relationship with sleep. She struggled with insomnia herself, was dependent on prescription medications for almost a decade. What I love about her is her holistic approach, not only to sleep, but also to life. Her wisdom and guidance are tremendous on this podcast. I learned several things and I can't wait for you to listen as well. Who's the person you're being? Are you satisfied? Welcome to Be The Person, a podcast for the brave and the curious, for people ready to explore their true potential. I'm your host, Annie Randall. Join me and let's get ready to go on this journey together. Welcome to Be The Person podcast. You are in for such a treat today. I have Morgan Adams with me and she is a sleep coach. And I don't know about you, but there have been nights that I struggle with sleep. So I am so excited to hear from Morgan today. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Anne. It's great to be here. Yeah, I can't wait for our conversation today. Part is selfish of like, I want to know the information. And so I was so excited when I learned, because honestly, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a sleep coach. So can you tell us about that and like, why you became a sleep coach, what that entails, just a little background. Yeah, well, I became a sleep coach because I actually had insomnia years ago. And it was a situation where I would lay in bed for up to two hours most nights waiting for sleep to come, tossing and turning. And after a few months of that, I just got so fed up. I went to my primary care doctor and I was given an Ambien prescription. And Ambien is just a really popular sleeping medication that I'm sure your listeners have heard of. At at that point in my life, I was a pharmaceutical sales rep. So taking a medication was no biggie to me. It was just like part of my daily kind of routine. So after about eight years of that, you know, it wasn't, well, I will say that the pills got me to sleep more quickly as advertised. The problem was the next day grogginess. Um, brain fog. And at this point, I had transitioned into a new role at work where I was responsible for uh, writing quick press releases and just being a fast writer. And the brain fog, I could not get the words on paper fast enough (laughs) for my bosses. And they were, you know, beginning to like worry, like what's going on with her? And so eight years into this, I met a man who is now my husband. But when we were beginning to date, He said to me, you know, when you take that pill to sleep, you kind of act like a zombie and it freaks me out. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, he's right. He's right. So that was really my impetus to stop taking the pills. I did what I don't recommend other people do. And that is take yourself off your medications without the guidance of your healthcare provider. I kind of went rogue. Um, However, I was able to successfully get off the pills. Slept pretty well for years, years after that. And then there was a plot twist that we can all relate to. We all collectively experienced that in 2020, right in the beginning of the pandemic, that first month or so, my sleep started to tank again. And I got really concerned because I did not want to go down that whole road of insomnia. So I turned to Google, Dr. Google, and found some, some sleep information and was able to get my sleep back on track pretty quickly. And in this time period, I also went um, to Facebook and started sharing just organically what I was doing to help my sleep. And I came to find out that there were a lot of other women in my circle who were struggling with their sleep at the same time. And that really gave me the impetus to make the sleep coaching an actual business. Now, there were sleep coaches when I started a few years ago, but it wasn't nearly, there were not nearly as many uh, sleep coaches as there are now. Um, And so that's, that's really kind of how I got started. And I'm just very much, you know, obsessed with sharing the information about sleep, 
being a good PR agent for sleep because in this culture, the hustle culture, hustle culture sleep has been um, demonized in, in certain circles as, you know, it's for the weak, for the lazy. Um, and I'm here to really change that narrative and help people um, get the sleep that they need and deserve to thrive. We need it to thrive. Gosh, I can relate to so much of that. The one is the lazy part. I have changed my mentality significantly over the years, but especially when we were opening businesses at Orange Theory, the demand was so high for just time and work that sleep was the one thing of like, I'll do that later. And I didn't understand the importance of it and like what it does for your body. Yeah, yeah. So many things that we're missing out on if we kind of prioritize prioritize working, burning the candle at both ends. So a lot of people in business are doing, we're taught that being successful in business means grinding it out, sacrificing sleep. And I think that um, Ariana Huffington, many years ago, she was sort of the, the first person to kind of plant that seed in business. She wrote a book, I'm forgetting the title, but she was sort of a pioneer in helping mass culture, business culture, especially um, take a different look at sleep because she actually got, you know, injured because she was sleep deprived and fell and hit her head or something like that. So um, she, she was the pioneer. And I think gradually as the, over the past few years that I've been doing this work, I'm seeing more and more positive content about sleep. So, so I feel very, very um, hopeful that the, the tide is starting to turn in that regard for sure. I hope so. I know it did for me. And the other thing that really resonated was, you know, during COVID was another time I really struggled with sleep. And I wear an aura ring tracker I have for many years. And what I noticed during that time was I think my body, you know, it was so freaked out, maybe <laughs> there's probably a better word, but it didn't know what to do with all of the stress. And going into deep sleep was something I really struggled with. So even if I was sleeping, you know, the deep sleep was a struggle. What are your thoughts on sleep trackers? I know there's several different ones. Do you recommend? Do you like those? Yeah, I have an ordering myself. And actually, we probably you probably got yours before I did. I got mine right when the pandemic started during that period when I was trying to recalibrate my sleep. And I have found it to be an extremely useful tool for myself. I do recommend them for people who are wanting to optimize their sleep. Also for people who are able to take a look at their data that the dashboard gives them and they're able to make behavioral changes based on what they're saying. You know, for example, a lot of people will notice when they get an aura ring how um, much it impacts their readiness scores or their sleep scores when they have alcohol. And so they may cut back or you know stop drinking altogether, but you know if you're if you're wearing an aura ring and you're seeing this data and you don't make any changes, what's the point? Why do you even get it in the first place? The people that I'm finding who don't do so well with it are actually, frankly, most of my clients because I actually work mostly with people who have insomnia, and people who have insomnia tend to have a lot of anxiety about their sleep. And when they see their data not look so great, like maybe their REM sleep is low one night or their deep sleep is low, they start to over-focus on those poor numbers, which exacerbates their anxiety, which doesn't end up helping their sleep at all. So when I'm working with somebody like that uh, and they say, should I get a sleep tracker? I'm usually like, no, let's wait till we get your sleep on a better track before you venture out into using the using an aura ring or a whoop or a Fitbit. So yeah, to answer your question, it, it depends on the person. You really have to know yourself and know how um, sort of your obsessive tendencies tend to be about data. Mm -hmm. One thing I will offer is that it's really important that we focus in on how we feel in the morning about our sleep versus what a tracker tells us. Because there've been studies where they have shown people who actually slept pretty well, they were told mm, your sleep data didn't look very good. And it was almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. They would all also you know, exhibit behaviors indicative of someone who wasn't sleeping well. So at the end of the day, we really need to prioritize 
how we're feeling about our sleep subjectively versus like honing in on those numbers every day. Yeah, that makes sense. And it makes sense for some people. It can be a great thing and others, not so much. I'm super curious. I test a lot of things on myself. So that's been from a behavioral change. It's been helpful for me because I do like to, to make those changes. It makes me cognizant of probably going to bed on time as well. Because sometimes, you know, you'll be up and you'll want to stay up. And it's like, wait a minute. I know what that does for my readiness. I know I need this much sleep. And it helps me get to bed on time is probably the biggest thing. Oh, yeah, that's great. That's great data. You've, you're, you're a perfect candidate. Then you were able to look at the data and then make changes based on yeah. what you saw. It's wonderful. I know so much happens in your body when you sleep. And I believe, you know, the audience probably knows some of that. But can you give us a little more detail of why sleep is so important? Sure. So it's really affecting us on every single level. If you, if you Googled sleep and fill in the blank, whatever health topic is important to you or whatever, whatever topic is important to you, you're going to find that sleep impacts it in, on some level. So we know that it affects our cardiovascular health. It impacts our hormone balance. We also know as of you know, fairly recently that we have something called a glymphatic system. And that is basically the lymphatic system for your brain. And when we are in the deep phases of sleep, what's happening is um, our brain is sort of getting a good brainwashing. It's sort of like the, the, the dishwasher cycle is being complete. And some of those amyloid plaques that contain toxins get wrung out in our deep sleep. So that's a really amazing um, feature of the deep sleep. We also know that our ability to emotionally regulate form memories, consolidate memories is enhanced in sleep. So we, we find that they're just on, on many different, even how you look, even your, the appearance of your skin and eyes, it just, it, it hits you on every single level um, with, with sleep for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I know a lot of our listeners are very into health, um, maintaining a healthy weight. There's been a lot of research too, I believe come out just on what it does to your glucose levels, your cortisol levels, if you're not sleeping, and just how that impacts maintaining a healthy weight. Can you talk to us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so it's really interesting when people are not getting enough sleep. I'll, I'll go into the hormone aspect first, because this is pretty fascinating. There are two uh, main hunger hormones that are, that are tied with sleep, so ghrelin and leptin. And when we are not getting enough sleep, ghrelin, which is, I, we call our hunger hormone. And I, I remember this by ghrelin, the gremlin, the hunger gremlin, yeah. that increases and it, and it stimulates our appetite while at the same time, the hormone leptin, which is our satiety hormone decreases. So we're not able to get as full quickly. So if you've ever had a poor night of sleep, you may recall that you just feel extra hungry. You're, you're just not satiated by your normal meal. And you also may be craving um, sweets, um, high carb foods, because your body is just searching for that quick energy hit. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as when you're not getting enough sleep, something interesting happens with your glucose. So they've also done studies where when people are sleep deprived, the next day, their blood gl glucose levels almost matches that of someone who's pre-diabetic. So it really can impact your blood glucose if you're not getting enough sleep. Um, it can raise your cortisol level as well. And so these things actually become sort of a vicious cycle. So if you're not getting, a, you know, like if you're not getting enough sleep, for example, you may be, you may be hitting it hard with the candies and the sweets, and that's just raising your glucose even more to kind of push you into the diabetic um, realm. So it's, um, it's quite, quite um, a vicious circle that we can get into sometimes. Absolutely. And I think when you see that data, you know, we may feel it, but when you see and look at what's actually going on in your body, this was one of the things that really made me change my mind about sleep. Like, oh my gosh, our body doesn't function like it was meant to if we're not sleeping correctly. All of our hormones are out of whack. We know if your glucose levels are high, your cortisol levels are high, you can't burn fat, you can't lose weight. So sometimes I think we're doing ourselves 
a favor in my mind by working harder and doing more, but you really end up hurting your body and all of the systems in it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And and just to share a personal story about how I viewed sleep in my 30s and exercise, I was very committed to going to the gym at like 4 or 5 a.m. And I had insomnia at this time. And I would still wake up, even though, I've had, though I had four or five hours of sleep, to get to the gym because I thought that exercise was more important than sleep. But if I knew, if I knew then what I know now, I would have allowed myself that time to sleep and recover instead of pushing my body so hard because it actually, it backfired on me. So, and I think a lot of women who are just high achievers, people who are really into exercise fall into that pattern of, um, I've got to get up for the class at 5 a.m., you know, versus a lot, if they've had a bad night of sleep versus allowing themselves like an extra hour, because that extra hour can make such a difference in how you perform and how you recover from that workout. Absolutely. So I think, and we have some people that come, you know, every single day at 5 a.m. And maybe some people can do it if you're going to bed again, really early. But like you said, if you have a bad night's sleep, like it's okay sometimes to say, my body needs this today. It might be yeah. better than actually working out. Yeah. And if you end up skipping that workout, you know, the more intense workout, still do some movement that day. Maybe just change what you're doing. Maybe take, you know, a gentle walk for a half hour or do some yoga. It doesn't mean you have to be completely sedentary. You can just not, you know, kind of dial it back a bit and still get in some movement, but just not as intense. Yeah, absolutely. When you think about setting yourself up for success, what would you say is really important for maybe both morning and night to get the best night's sleep? Yeah. So there's a quote by Louise Hay that I love, how you start your day is how you live your day. Mm -hmm. And so I really believe that um, good sleep happens the moment our, our feet hit the ground in the morning. And so I'm a big proponent of having some kind of routine for yourself in the morning that sets the intention for the day. And that can look very different for a lot of people. Um, sometimes it looks like prayer. Sometimes it looks like, looks like journaling, meditation, taking a walk. But just even if you've got like 10 minutes doing something on a, you know, on a regular basis to kind of get you a little bit decompressed and prepare you for your day, because if you start your day in this kind of high stress, high cortisol state, your, your state of being tends to flow like that throughout the day and into the night. So it's, it's kind of interesting how, how that works. As far as the evening, I would say, you know, there are many things you can do in the evening to kind of prepare your body and your mind for sleep. I would say start with dimming your lights a couple hours before bed. Um, for example, a lot of people have these bright LED lights um, overhead in their, ho their homes. Turn those off and turn on a table light instead, something dimmer, turning down your um, thermo thermostat a couple of degrees. You want your bedroom environment to be a few degrees cooler than the rest of your home. So you're looking at probably mid 60s as the ideal sleep temperature, plus or minus, depending on your sensitivity to temperature. And then really prioritizing a time to wind down. Um, ideally an hour, but we know that not everyone has the luxury of an hour. You know, if you're a busy mom, if you've got multiple responsibilities, you may not be able to do an hour, but at least carving out a half hour for yourself to do something that is going to put yourself in sort of a down state mode. You know, you're not having a lot of stimulation. You're not having blue light. You're not having um, stimulating conversations with your partner or your children. Um, you're just doing something relaxing and that the definition of relaxing is so different for many people, but just, you know, some examples would be similar to what you might do in the morning, meditation, journaling, um, breath work, prayer, gentle yoga are all great things. Also taking a warm bath. Um, I'm just, a, I'm just, I really believe that the bookends of your day are so important. And I've actually created a free mini course that is about specifically morning and evening routines for better sleep. So we can maybe share that with your, your listeners, but it's, it goes into more detail, but I'm just 
I'm such a proponent of those bookends being, um, you know, being priorities for people for sure. Yeah. I thank you for sharing that. I'll definitely link to it in the show notes. I appreciate that because I agree. And, you know, this has again, been a big change for me over the years, like right away in the morning, I would get up and start either working or work out. And I really have changed that to meditation and prayer. I'll take my dog for a walk. Um, I kind of ease into the morning now, whereas before I feel like I jumped out of bed and started sprinting. And the same with the nighttime, just how important that is to just have that wind down time. Yes. Tell us, like, what are the impacts of screens, especially because I know I can be guilty of this sometimes of like watching TV or being on my phone probably during my wind down time. And I know it's probably not the best but I still do it sometimes. Yeah. So that's a really nuanced conversation and one that's sort of giving um, the sleep field a, a little bit of, um, you know, interesting conversation. So my take on it is that we need to be cognizant of the blue light that's hitting our eyes at night, especially if you have light eyes, you're more sensitive to the blue light. I'm a big fan of blue blocking glasses. Um, the kinds that are amber or red. So there are a lot on the market that say they're blue blocking, but they're clear. And if you actually uh, wore them and looked at like a blue display, like a digital display, you see the blue. So they're not blue light blocking glasses. (laughs) They're kind of being proven wrong. So those are a really great tool to use if you're going to be on a screen. Um, There's also, if you have to be on your laptop or your phone, There are little hacks you can use. One is called fl.ux. That's for your laptop. It kind of makes the screen a more yellow tone. And then there's a hack for your phone um, where you can have your screen red. So you basically triple click the side button to make your screen red. And I don't know the directions off the top of my head, but if you just Google how to make screen red on phone, it'll give you all the detailed instructions on how to do that. But I think one thing that we need to also consider um, just as much or maybe not even, maybe even more than the blue light is the content of the things we're consuming. So we want to, you know, the thing is we want to be careful about things we watch on TV, like movies we watch. Um, So for example, you could have your blue, blue light blocking glasses on, which is awesome. But if you're watching a horror movie or something scary or even the media, the news, you're still putting your brain into sort of an overactive mode. Um, you're not you're not putting your brain in a position of being very relaxed when you're watching content like that. So I think they they kind of go hand in hand. You need to kind of be be mindful about um, your eyes and also just the content of what you're looking at. So I'm not a big fan of doing the social media scrolling. Um, before bed for for a few reasons. One of them is the content can be kind of triggering. And also like the content sucks you in. The whole job of social media is to keep you on the platform. So just kind of be mindful. And also, you know, there's, there is um, some merit in doing sort of a screen curfew. If you're the kind of person who gets a little bit tempted by the screens and like scrolling is to have a, you know, hard and fast cutoff time at which point your 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 phone goes to another room for the rest of the night and overnight so that it's not with you all the time. Yeah, those are all such great tips. I love those. You know, one thing I've noticed, and I don't know if it's just me or if you find this with your clients, all often have still some challenges sleeping, but my husband will be having no issues whatsoever. Do you find that women have a harder time sleeping or maybe that's just in my own house? I think you're right on the money. And I've, I've heard this from many of my clients. Um, mostly they are women and they are like, my husband's out like a light. He sleeps so great. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the data shows that women have more sleep challenges. We're about two times more likely to have insomnia than men. And there are really a few main reasons why women tend to have more sleeping challenges than men. One is kind of an obvious reason from teenagerhood through menopause, our hormones are in flux throughout our life, most of our lifetime. And that can really impact our sleep. Also socio-cultural um, reasons. For example, women tend to 
take on more roles. So a woman in midlife, for example, who 45, 50, she could be having kids at home who she's responsible for. She could also be having aging parents who she needs to be looking after. And on top of that, she might be at the height of her career in a managerial role or running a business like yourself. And so, so many competing demands, we often call that the sandwich generation. And that creates a lot of stress and anxiety, which spills over into our sleep. And then the final reason I think is really because mental health challenges, specifically anxiety and depression, tend to affect women more. And when you have those types of challenges with anxiety and depression, that leaves you a bit more vulnerable to insomnia. So we do we do have it a little bit more difficult. That's not just your N of one. I think it's it's an N of many. Yeah. That you're seeing. <laughs> Now, I know a lot of my friends are kind of at this age, the menopause age, and we've had several talks about, you know, the struggle with sleep there and because of the different hormone changes. Is that something that you see as well? Absolutely. Yeah. I'd say half of my clients um, are probably dealing with that. And it's tricky. Um, One of the things that I usually have a conversation with my clients about if we're really sure that it's the the hormonal things that are keeping them up is looking into hormone replacement therapy. And that's a whole other ball of wax, but it does, it, it is very helpful for a lot of the vasomotor symptoms like hot flashes and night sweats that keep women up. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are other, there are other hacks too, but if you're getting kind of to the root cause, that's something to, to maybe talk to your doctor about if it's, if you've done all the other things, but you still can't solve the um, sleep problems, it's, it's, a, it's a good route to take or to explore. Yeah, definitely maybe some hormone testing at least to see where you're yeah. at. Yeah, I, I would highly recommend getting a, a hormone test done and, and re- yeah, really seeing kind of where you, where you land because it's a, it's a really, it's a hard time in our lives, you know, with, with the fluctuations. And um, I believe the most recent statistic is about half of women in midlife are struggling with sleep. And unfortunately, we don't have, you know, enough practitioners who are on the medical side who are super uh, equipped to handle that. In fact, um, primary care doctors tend to be the doctors that women turn to first or anyone turns to first when they're having sleep problems and not to knock primary care doctors at all because they do so much. Um, They handle so many things. But in med school, most of them are getting about two hours of sleep science training. And that is grossly inadequate for the amount of time we spend sleeping. If you think about, we spend a third of our lives sleeping, you would think they'd get more than two hours of sleep science education. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that there are, um, you know, people like myself in sleep coaching who can kind of help out and, um, make other suggestions and um, recommendations for when the primary care doctors may not um, have the tools because te- they typically will, and I'm generalizing here, Anne, but they typically will either prescribe a pill like Ambien or you know a benzodiazepine or just give somebody a list of sleep hygiene tips and say good luck. Yeah. So it's How kind of- that- differ like from what you would do as a sleep coach? Because I'm guessing a lot of people listening, honestly, one, didn't know there was such thing as a sleep coach or two, exactly what that means. What yeah. That yeah. So I consider myself a holistic sleep coach. And what I mean by that is I take into consideration like all facets of my client's life. So we're, we're really delving deep and I'm really focusing in on getting to the root cause of their sleep problem. So we're looking at things like nutrition, diet, um, chronotype. That mean, that's basically whether you're a night owl or an early morning lark. Um, I'm also looking at circadian health and managing light and dark. And then on top of that, there's something called CBTI, which is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And that is actually the first line of um, treatment for insomnia above sleeping pills. And it's the gold standard. It's been used since the 1980s. So I incorporate quite a bit of those techniques into my coaching. And um, not to go off on too much of a tangent, but CBTI um, 
really is primarily based on a couple of different principles with modifying behaviors. And so how that plays out is often, um, you know, how you're using your bed. Are you using your bed only for sleep and in intimacy? And then sleep scheduling, kind of um, customizing a sleep-wake protocol for you based on how much time you're actually able to spend sleeping. And then the cognitive part of CBTI is really helping people manage their thoughts, beliefs, attitudes about sleep because our sleep mindset is so critical in how successful we are in overcoming insomnia. So there are a lot of different things that I use and I'm glad that I have the, the toolkit that I, that I have um, because people are so different. And so I don't just take like a cookie cutter approach. Everyone is going to get sort of a customized plan for them because I do believe that is really the best approach to take for people. Yeah. So good. Because I think a lot of times it just is frustrating. You can't sleep or you're up in the middle of the night and you're thinking you, you just want to go to sleep. So I think just knowing there are tools and, um, people like you as a coach, I think is super helpful. Yeah. That was one of my questions because it's something usually I can fall asleep, but a lot of times in the middle of the night, I will wake up and then most of the time I can go back to sleep. But there are nights, I think my brain starts going and I'm guessing some of our audience has the same thing happen, um, that I can't go back to sleep. What are your thoughts or solutions on that? Yeah, that is actually one of the most common uh, sleep challenges that I see within my clients. So there are a couple of things that I would suggest doing preemptively to help with that situation. So a lot of people um, are so busy during the day, they go from appointment to appointment, they literally have no white space or downtime in their day. And so what ends up happening is once their head hits the pillow or they wake up at two or three at 3 a.m., all of those things that they didn't deal with during the day, all of those thoughts, emotions, those come bubbling up to the surface. So what I recommend doing is taking mindfulness snacks. So you've probably heard of exercise snacks, being in the exercise field. It's the same principle. It's like taking these small little breaks throughout your day. So I would suggest starting with maybe two or three 10-minute mindfulness snacks where you really just disconnect yourself from any information incoming. So that could mean taking a walk out in nature, leaving your phone at home, you know, not listening to a podcast, although yours is great. Just, you know, taking a pause on the podcast, um, allowing your, your brain to, to deal with some of the thoughts and emotions that are coming up during your day. It could also look like meditation or breath work. Um, so taking a couple of those a day is really good. And then for people who are a little bit more worry prone and have, um, just more propensity to ruminate at night and worry and that, and that's keeping them up. There's a technique from CBTI, which we just talked about called the, um, constructive worry exercise. And this is a really simple exercise that you can do for like 15 minutes. I would suggest maybe doing it before bed, maybe like after dinner, but not too close up to bed. And basically what you do is you take a piece of paper, you draw a line down the center, and on the left-hand side column, you have a column for worries or concerns. And on the right-hand side column, you have solutions. And basically you're brain dumping. So you're just listing the worries and concerns. And on the other column, you're writing down the next best step to solving that issue. Then you take that piece of paper, you can actually just put it by your bedside table. And if you wake up in the middle of the night, you can say to yourself, I'm done my worrying for the day. There's literally nothing that I can do at this point about X, Y, Z problem at 2 a.m. It will have to get thought about the next day during my worry session. So that's a little bit more of an advanced technique. And it really does help a lot. You just have to be consistent with doing it because you're essentially training your brain. I like that. I like both of those, actually, because I, I'm guilty of you know, going throughout the day and not having a lot of time just to think. Um, so having that downtime, and I'm a journaler of just maybe doing that. I'm also a person who doesn't easily get in touch with my feelings of like, I yeah. have to consider because of, of busyness, I can just put on a game face and go all day. Yeah. 
Yeah. And sometimes that's helpful, but sometimes, like you're saying, I think that probably for me comes out at night and maybe in the form of worry too. I, I love that idea and I'm going to incorporate that in just to give my brain a little time during the day and then at night to make that list. I think actually that will be super helpful for me. Good. And, you know, just one final thought about that, that problem is if you are, um, in a situation where the worries are getting the best of you at 3 a.m., a couple things to remind yourself uh, or a couple things to do. Number one, remind yourself that your brain at midnight or after midnight, there's not really a specific time, but it's called mind after midnight. Your brain is actually operating from your amygdala. It's operating from your non-rational part of your brain. So a lot of the thoughts that you have in the wee hours of the night are they tend to be negative, a little bit catastrophic. I've, I've noticed this with myself a lot. And I'm not immune to these problems myself. Even though I'm a sleep coach, I still have a normal, normal person's brain. <laughs> so I have to kind of talk myself down and say, okay, the thoughts you're having, they're not rational. In the morning, you're going to think a lot more rationally. So that's one thing to remind yourself if you're kind of going off the rails with a lot of um, worries that seem kind of outlandish. And then if you just really are kind of spiraling in bed with a lot of worries and you can't really turn it off, is getting out of bed and going to another room and doing something relaxing and dim light until you become sleepy again. And that's another technique based from CBTI, which we just mentioned. And really the goal with that is to break the association between your bed and anxiety because we want to always remember to kind of pair your bed with sleep, not the anxiety. Yeah, so good. I know that I've done that as well. And one of the things like faith is important to me, like I'll get up and I'm a prayer journaler of just, I will start journaling prayers because I think you're right. Nothing I'm thinking at three in the morning is super positive. Um, and so sometimes it's like, you know what, I think I need to give this all to God and let him deal with it versus my own brain because it's not working well. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So good. Thank you for sharing that. Of course. What about alcohol? Can you can you talk to us a little bit about that? Because I know you mentioned it earlier. What are your thoughts that's just from a scientific perspective, like we see on maybe a, a sleep tracker when you do drink at night, like what you can expect and what happens in your body? Yeah. So alcohol is basically the number one sleep aid that we have because it sedates you and it helps you fall asleep a little bit more quickly. So there's that plus side. However, the downside is that it really does fragment or disrupt your sleep. What it does is it kind of shortens your REM phase of sleep in the beginning part of the night, which is a really important stage of sleep. And then you have something called REM rebound where you may have an extended REM phase at the end of the night. Um, that's also punctuated by a lot of brief awakenings, maybe to go to the bathroom and you often wake up feeling just unrestored. So, you know, they've done studies on this where they've looked at the amount of alcohol somebody has had and how much quality is affected by the alcohol. And the statistic is less than one drink for a woman can reduce her sleep quality by like 38%. So that's a lot of sleep quality to leave on the table. So as you might expect, when you add more drinks of alcohol to that, you're going to have even more of a knockdown effect on your sleep quality. So um, I personally have experienced this with myself and my aura data. I used to drink a lot more than I do now. And the aura was one of the things that helped me kind of like wake up to that fact because I really didn't like seeing my readiness score tank or my deep REM sleep tank. Not to mention I didn't feel so great in the morning. So it's been a great, um, it's been a great tool. The sleep tracker has been a great tool for me and just kind of ratcheting down the amount of alcohol I have. So if, if someone does want to drink alcohol, what I would offer is that think about happy hour versus the nightcap. So instead of having a glass of wine with your dinner at eight o'clock when you're out with friends, have your glass of wine at five o'clock because you really want to allow that three hour time frame between your last drink and going to bed. So you want to give your body enough time to process that alcohol. 
So that's that's sort of a little tip if you do want to, you know, still engage in alcohol, but you want to feel good in the morning. Yeah. I think that's super important because a lot of times I, I believe, and I've seen this in my own data of like, oh, just one drink or I'll have a glass of wine or something like that. And you're like, wait a minute, what it does to your sleep and your score the next day, really bring it down. And again, not to say that I don't drink at all. Like on the weekend, sometimes going out with friends, like I'll just be like, okay, yes, I'm going to choose this. But I will say like, I don't drink during the week because of that at all. And even like you said, going out to dinner where I might have had a glass of wine before, I'm really going to think twice about it because of my sleep, uh, knowing what it does. And sometimes, again, I will choose yes, but sometimes it'll make me choose no. Yeah. I mean, I think it's good to be aware and kind of have informed consent, if you will. Like you, you, you know full well, I know full well, but sometimes we go ahead and make the choice that we're not going to feel so well because we kind of want to be in the moment, but at least we know we're aware of that. We know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So I would say for a lot of our listeners, especially if you don't use a sleep tracker and maybe you aren't, you know, don't see that data of just really knowing, I wish there was people that this didn't affect, but I think it's across the board, men and women, I think, would you agree that science shows alcohol does affect sleep? Yeah, it affects us both, uh, men and women. We tend to have a little bit more sensitivity to alcohol when we become midlife as women. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of women that I know in midlife notice that, and I've noticed this myself, but I think it happened a little bit later for me than a lot of women. Um, they're just not tolerating it as well. Like they could maybe in their twenties or thirties, they could have had three drinks, no problem in one night. And then their forties and fifties hit and they're like, oh my gosh, I feel awful. I feel like I've gotten hit by, hit by a truck. So we're just not, we're just not able to process that as well as we age. And I think that's what makes a lot of women kind of just step back and say, it's just not worth it. Yeah. So helpful. What about sleep supplements? I know there's a huge market for that. Can you talk to us a little bit about those and just thoughts overall on, on sleep supplements? Yeah. So the general consensus on sleep supplements um, is that they are useful to an extent. So there's... Um, there's not a lot of data about it helping too much with people who have chronic insomnia because a sleep supplement cannot really um, overcome what we call the hyperarousal that happens with insomnia. But if you're somebody who has like the occasional sleep issue or you want to optimize, I don't think there's really any harm in trying sleep supplements, but I really, I feel like people should um, have realistic expectations of what the supplement can do um, because I mean, if they really worked, if they really worked, I mean, we wouldn't, they're just, there's so many out there. Like we just, I've never seen anybody like completely reverse their sleep problem with just one supplement. Yeah. Have you? I mean, I've just never, yeah. I've never seen it happen. <laughs> I mean, and not to say that I've never used sleep supplements. I've, I've tested them. I've played with them and they all kind of, I've never noticed like the needle moving in either direction, taking a sleep supplement. Um, and I think that you need to really consider the source of the supplement because there are a lot of companies out there who are using cheap ingredients. Mm -hmm. um, and one that comes to mind especially would be melatonin. So there was a study a few years ago where they went into a pharmacy in Canada and took melatonin off the shelves, tested the melatonin, and they found that the amount of melatonin that was actually in the pill was often not matching with what was advertised on the label. So people were getting either way, much, way less melatonin than was advertised or a lot more. And the lot more part can be a little bit problematic because melatonin can leave you really groggy if you take too much of it. So you really need to kind of check your source um, if you're going to go down the route of synthetic melatonin. Yeah, that is one that always makes me feel terrible in the morning. Anything with melatonin in it, I completely stay away from. One of them that's helped me, it's not necessarily a sleep supplement. I think I was probably just deficient in it overall, was magnesium. Mm -hmm. And 
dialing that in did help my overall sleep quality. But that's yeah. the one. Yeah, magnesium tends to be probably like the most popular one that I see people take. And I think it can be helpful to a certain extent. Um, but again, if you have chronic insomnia, like I've seen my clients with that take magnesium, it, it really makes very little difference. So it kind of depends on your starting point. But if for an average sleeper, I think there is the potential to boost it a little bit. Yeah. What would you say as we wrap up, maybe just some final tips. And then I definitely want people to know how to contact you because I think although some of these tips will be helpful, there'll be other people that need more of a personalized approach that you could give. But if you had to think just generally, what are, what are a few tips that you could leave us with? Yeah, I would say, first of all, um, think about your consistency of your sleep-wake cycle. And really the most important thing to remember is the importance of waking up at the same time every morning, because that solid anchor wake up time really entrains your circadian rhythm. And when you have that consistent wake up time, what you'll notice is that you're more likely to become sleepy around the same time each night, because after you've woken up, you need about 16, 17 hours to build up the appropriate amount of adenosine in your sleep chemical before that needs to be released. So you're going to find yourself with a more re regular going to bedtime if your wake time is really anchored. And there is a little bit of flexibility with that because people, you know, my clients especially, they'll push back on me a little bit and say, well, even on the weekend? And that's like, yeah, even on the weekend. But if you are going out and you're going to be out later than usual, you do have about 30 minutes of wiggle room in there. So it doesn't need to be on the dot every single day, but just as consistent as you can get about your wake up time. And also along the same lines of uh, something in the morning is getting uh, natural daylight exposure as soon as you can in the morning, uh, ideally within 30 to 60 minutes, because what that does again, just like with waking up at the same time every morning, that it strengthens your circadian rhythm as well. It lets you know um, it's daytime, it's time to be alert. And one little caveat to this I'll add is that you want to go outside without your sunglasses or without glasses on at all because the light from the sun actually needs to hit your retina. And from there, there there's this wonderful um, cascade of hormones and neurotransmitters that happens because your suprachiasmatic nucleus sort of um, controls that situation. And you're going to find that your cortisol boosts, your melatonin from the night before shuts down, your serotonin gets boosted, and you're also able to prepare melatonin for the following night. So a bunch of really, really cool things happen when your light hits, uh, when the light hits your eyes. And then I think finally, and this will resonate for so many of your people, Anne, is exercise as a way of helping us regulate our sleep. So we've, we've, we've done several studies showing that exercise helps with sleep efficiency, quality. And we know that um, from a meta-analysis of like 13 different studies that sleep, uh, that exercise helps with our deep sleep, which is, you know, one of the most important stages of sleep. So really staying regular with your exercising, you know, getting maybe 30 minutes a day, most days of the week seems to be sufficient. You don't need to knock yourself out in order to get the benefits, but it's just incredibly helpful um, in terms of helping boost our sleep drive. So those are the tips I would offer. I think it's important to remember too that there's so many things out there in the world of sleep, so much technology, the, the aura ring, the mattress pods, and like, I love all of that stuff. I truly do, and I use it. But before you go down that road, really hone in on the basics, the, some of the things I just mentioned, because they're not sexy, they're not novel, but they actually are so powerful and they do work well. So if you're, if you're on the journey of fixing your sleep, start with those basics before you graduate into the more advanced techniques. Yeah, such good advice. Thank you. I know some people, again, are going to want to connect with you because they're thinking, I, I am one of those people that have insomnia. I've tried these things. Um, how, what's the best way to do that? Sure. So if you go to my website, morganadamswellness.com, you will see the opportunity to schedule a, a free sleep clarity call, which is basically a, 
a free consultation where we can talk about your sleep struggle and see if sleep coaching is the best route for you. And as I mentioned in our talk, I also have a free mini course that you can sign up for as well on my website. So everything you need to know is there. If, you, if you're on Instagram, I'm very active there. Um, MorganAdams.wellness is my handle. Feel free to DM me and say hi. I love to talk about sleep. Don't be a stranger at all. Awesome. I will make sure I put all of those in our show notes so people can definitely connect with you. So thank you so much. I think just so much wisdom and clarity around this, which can be a little bit confusing, frustrating of a topic, I think has been super helpful today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining Be The Person podcast. If this resonated with you or you know somebody that struggles with sleep, please share this with them. It could make such a difference in their life. And always, it would mean the world to me if you would give us a five-star review on the platform you're listening from. It will help the podcast grow and reach more listeners. Thanks for joining today. I have a new protein bar that I just love. Aloha Protein Bars. They have tons of flavors. My favorite is Peanut Butter Cup. It gives me my chocolate fix for the day. It's gluten and dairy free. It's plant-based, which I know you're thinking that does not sound good, but it is delicious. It comes in snack size, regular size, and I have both in my cabinet at all times. Check out the link in the show notes for 20% off your first order.